Hello and welcome to Indus News live from Istanbul. I'm Javad Dehami and these are the headlines. Pakistan's Foreign Office says India's disinformation campaign has come under international scrutiny. The Foreign Office spokesman says a European Parliament committee has taken up the matter after the EU disinfo lab exposed the malicious campaign. He said Kashmiris will never accept India's illegal occupation. The Taliban have urged President Joe Biden not to repeat the mistakes made by former U.S. administrations in Afghanistan. In a statement, the group said it has been established that there is no military solution to the conflict. The Taliban also called on Washington to fulfill its commitments under the Doha Peace Agreement. In Russia, a court has rejected Kremlin critic Alexei Navalny's appeal against his detention. Navalny was remanded in custody for 30 days on the 18th of January after flying back to Russia for the first time since being poisoned. His arrest sparked a nationwide protest and condemnation from the West. Pakistan is set to receive the first tranche of 500,000 doses of a coronavirus vaccine from China on Saturday. The country has so far recorded 11,514 deaths and nearly 540,000 infections. Globally, the virus has claimed over 2 million lives and has infected more than 100 million people. In cricket, South Africa lead Pakistan by 29 runs in their second innings of the first test at the National Stadium Karachi. The visitors end the third day at 187 for four after bowling Pakistan out for 378 in the first innings. Yasser Shah was the pick of the bowlers for taking three wickets. Those were the headlines and detailed stories right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back and now for the news in detail. Islamabad says international scrutiny of India's global disinformation campaign against Pakistan is underway. The Foreign Office says a European Parliament committee held a hearing on Delhi's disinformation activities following the release of the EU disinfo lab report. In a press briefing, spokesperson Zahid Hafiz Chaudhary said the world is taking India's misuse of platforms seriously. He said by observing the Republic Day of India as a black day, the Kashmiris sent a message to the world that they will never accept India's occupation. Discussing Afghanistan, he said Pakistan has condemned the high levels of violence in the war-torn country. Chaudhary said Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi spoke to his Afghan counterpart Hanif Atmar over the phone. Qureshi emphasized that progress in the intra-Afghan negotiations will also help reduce violence leading to a ceasefire. Pakistani Hindus who went to India last year continue to return to their country through the Vaga border. The Indian government's heavy-handed attitude and the senseless killing of 11 Pakistani Hindus in Jodhpur have forced them to return. Upon their return, the Hindu families were given a warm welcome in Pakistan at Vaga border. The government of Pakistan has assured them of all possible cooperation. A returning Hindu family said they migrated to India for a better future, but they faced only hardship there. They also urged Pakistan to press India to carry out a comprehensive investigation into the mysterious killings of 11 Hindus. The Taliban have urged President Joe Biden not to repeat mistakes made by former U.S. administrations in Afghanistan. In a statement, the group said it has been established that there is no military solution to the conflict. It added that the ongoing intra-Afghan talks have yielded positive results. 
The Taliban also called on Washington to fulfill their commitments under the Doha Peace Agreement. Meanwhile, President Joe Biden's administration has asked its negotiator with Taliban, Zalmay Khalid Zad, to stay on. In Afghanistan, the chief of a militant group, Mangal Bagh, has been killed in a bomb attack in Nangarhar. According to Nangarhar's governor, two accomplices of Bagh were also killed in the attack. No group has claimed the responsibility for the attack. Bagh was affiliated with an outlawed militant group which was responsible for many terrorist activities in Pakistan. China says Taiwan is an inseparable part of the country and warned that its independence will mean a war. At a news briefing, Chinese Defense Ministry spokesperson Wu Qian said armed forces will respond to any provocation. The spokesperson said the military activities in Taiwan Strait are necessary to address the security situation. He added there are solemn responses to external interference and provocations by independence forces. Wu said a handful of people in Taiwan are seeking the island's independence and those who play with fire will burn themselves. This follows a U.S. push for Taiwan's sovereignty in violation of its agreement with Beijing to abide by the One China policy. South Korea's Prime Minister Shang se kyun says Pyongyang and Washington must seek a denuclearization deal. In an interview, he said the deal needs to include halting North Korea's nuclear activity in exchange for sanctions relief. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and former U.S. President Donald Trump vowed to build new relations at a summit in 2018. Pyongyang had offered to dismantle its main nuclear complex in exchange for the lifting of major UN sanctions. But the US said abolishing the facility was not enough and called on the North to hand over its nuclear weapons. The South Korean Premier said limited sanctions relief may help revive the momentum of any talks. Everyone knows that the problem cannot be solved without dialogue. Our job is to come up with creative ideas so that talks will be held as quickly as possible. In Russia, a court has rejected Kremlin a critic Alexei Navalny's appeal against his detention. Navalny was remanded in custody for 30 days on 18th of January for alleged parole violations that he denies. His allies have called for new protests this weekend to demand his release. The authorities have said any demonstrations will be illegal and broken up. Tens of thousands of Russians protested against his jailing on Saturday, with the West calling on Moscow to release him. Baltic countries, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, have called on the EU to impose new sanctions on Moscow. Britain has also revealed that it was keeping sanctions on Russia under review. The U.S. has paused the $8 billion weapon sales to Saudi Arabia and the UAE, authorized by former President Donald Trump. Talking to reporters, Secretary of State Antony Blinken said a review of the deal aims to ensure it advances U.S. strategic objectives. Blinken termed the move routine procedure for any new administration. Talking about Yemen, Blinken said the ongoing conflict and violations by warring sides have caused a severe humanitarian crisis, which is why he said the previous administration's call for sanctions on Houthis is being re-evaluated. Uh, and so it's vitally important, even in the midst of this crisis, that we do everything we can to get humanitarian assistance to uh, the people of Yemen who are in desperate need. And what we want to make sure is that any steps we are taking uh, do not uh, get in the way uh, of providing that, uh, uh, that assistance. Speaking on Iran, he said Washington will rejoin the 2015 nuclear deal only if Tehran resumes complete compliance with the pact. Now moving on, Palestine has welcomed U.S. President Joe Biden's announcement to resume diplomatic ties. Ramallah says Palestine's president and prime minister welcomed the move which emphasizes U.S. support for the two-state solution. A government spokesperson said Palestine is keen to resume talks in line with the UN resolutions and international law. Ibrahim Milham said any solution that does not take into account Palestinian rights mandated by international laws will fail. In another development, the Palestinian leadership has condemned the demolition of a mosque in occupied West Bank by the Israeli forces. Israeli forces raised the mosque and several structures in the West Bank. 
The Iraqi army says it has killed seven ISIS militants, including three group leaders, in a counterterrorism operation in the north. In a statement, the military said the terrorists were killed in a gunfight in Kirkuk city's Al Chai Valley. It says several terrorists detonated themselves in their shelters after the raid. Earlier, the Iraqi forces in Kirkuk also foiled ISIS attacks and arrested two operatives on Wednesday. In 2017, Iraq declared victory over the terrorist group who overtook a third of the country in 2014. But in recent months, suspected militants have stepped up attacks, particularly between Kirkuk and the Yala province. Britain has welcomed the exploratory talks between Turkey and Greece. Talks resumed on Monday in Istanbul after months of tension and pressure from the European Union. In a tweet, a UK's Foreign Office Minister for the EU, Wendy Morton, said the resumption of talks is pivotal for stability in the eastern Mediterranean. Earlier, Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlu Shavashalu said the talks were held in a positive atmosphere. He also urged Greece to refrain from provocations at a time when Ankara is trying to establish a positive agenda with the EU. The two NATO members held 60 rounds of talks from 2002 to 2016 to address various disagreements, but with little progress. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has arrived in Scotland to confront the growing support for another independence referendum. Ahead of his trip, Johnson recalled the privileges that Scotland is receiving as part of the UK, including access to the coronavirus vaccine. However, Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon criticised Johnson's trip to Glasgow. She questioned if the Prime Minister's reasons for visiting are essential and called the trip a bad example. But Johnson's spokesman defended the trip, saying his visit to Scotland is a fundamental part of his job. Johnson's ties with the Scottish First Minister have not been in the best shape as he dismissed multiple calls for another referendum. The United States and Germany have vowed a close cooperation on a wide range of issues. In their first phone call, a German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas congratulated his U.S. counterpart Antony Blinken on his appointment. In a tweet, Germany Foreign Ministry said both agreed to cooperate closely on issues including China's global role and Iran nuclear deal. Meanwhile, the new U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin also held a telephonic conversation with his German counterpart. In a statement, the Pentagon said the Defense Secretary praised Berlin for hosting U.S. troops. It said Austin also spoke about a forced posture in Afghanistan and Iraq and combating the malign influence of shared strategic rivals. At least 16 people have been killed and several others wounded in three separate bomb blasts in Somalia. The military says a bomb targeted a vehicle carrying military personnel near Balad Middle Shabale. In a statement, the military said 12 soldiers and two civilians were killed in that attack. It said after the bombing, a gunfight broke out between the army, backed by the African Union peacekeeping mission and the militants. The Al-Qaeda-linked Al-Shabaab group has claimed the responsibility for the attack. Meanwhile, a blast in a restaurant killed a soldier and wounded at least five civilians in Dinsur in the southwestern Bay region. Over in the capital Mogadishu, a bomb blast killed a civilian and wounded two others. More stories to follow right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Brazil has registered more than 1,200 new COVID-19 deaths and 63,000 cases overnight. The nationwide tally of cases is approaching 9 million. Meanwhile, a Britain and the European Union row over AstraZeneca vaccine continues as Brussels rejected that the UK has first claim on doses produced at local plants. Globally, the virus has claimed 2 million lives and infected more than 100 million people. More in this report. As the world's fight against the coronavirus pandemic continues, the Global COVID Performance Index has ranked New Zealand, Vietnam and Taiwan as top three for successfully handling the outbreak. 
Some of the world's most developed countries, including Britain and the United States, are placed near the bottom of the list, which evaluated 98 countries' response to the crisis. The Americas only now account for 1 million COVID-19 deaths, making half of the global fatalities. Meanwhile, the White House official says it will take months before a vaccine is available to the general public. We change the vaccine composition twice a year for the northern and southern hemisphere and we're able to issue vaccines very very quickly uh, to combat the the d predominant flu strains every year so there's no reason even down the line if this virus evolves to a point where our vaccines uh, begin to lose effectiveness we can adapt those vaccines and i believe we can adapt those vaccines quickly AstraZeneca is set to produce more than 90 million coronavirus vaccine shots in Japan. Over in Europe, the EU has demanded Oxford's drug maker to spell out how it will supply the bloc with reserved vaccines amid a deadlock in crisis talks. Meanwhile, a study found that Pfizer's vaccine appeared to lose only a small bit of effectiveness against the new variant first found in South Africa. The World Health Organization says vaccines can be adopted to new variants if they impact the effectiveness of vaccines. We're facing two constraining factors. The first is getting enough supply quickly enough. And the second is the ability to administer the vaccines quickly once they're produced and sent out to the sites. We are taking action to increase supply and increase capacity. But even so, it will be months before everyone who wants a vaccine will be able to get one. Australia has extended its suspension of quarantine-free travel with New Zealand as the later detected the two cases of the newly found variant. In Lebanon, at least 20 people were injured in clashes after security forces opened fire on protesters in the Tripoli district north of the capital, Beirut. Lebanese took to the streets for a third day to denounce the deteriorating living conditions amid a strict lockdown to prevent the spread of the virus. Pakistan is set to receive the first tranche of 500,000 doses of a coronavirus vaccine from China on a Saturday. Speaking in Islamabad, Special Assistant to Prime Minister on Health, Dr. Faisal Sultan said this during a session on the country's vaccination strategy. Sultan said the government's vaccination plan will follow the best global practices and health guidelines. Pakistan has already approved the AstraZeneca vaccine, Chinese-made Sinopharm and Russian-developed Sputnik V vaccine. The country has so far recorded 11,514 deaths and over half a million cases of COVID-19. Pakistan has awarded its second highest civilian medal to Jordan's military chief, Major General Yusuf Ahmad al Hanaiti. Pakistan's President Arif Alvi conferred hilal e imtiaz on the Jordanian military official at a special ceremony in Islamabad. The award was given in recognition of his services for promoting defense cooperation between the two countries. The President said Pakistan and Jordan enjoy excellent relations based on common faith and cultural affinities. He stressed the need to further strengthen bilateral economic and defense cooperation. In Pakistan, the Supreme Court has ordered the release of the prime accused in the 2002 beheading of American journalist Daniel Pearl. The three-judge bench was hearing an appeal against the acquittal of Ahmed Umar Said Sheikh. The attorney for Sheikh said the court also ordered the release of three other accused. Daniel Pearl was doing research on extremism in Karachi when he was abducted in January 2002. A graphic video showing his decapitation was delivered to the U.S. consulate a month later. Subsequently, Sheikh was arrested in 2002 and sentenced to death by a trial court. U.S. President Joe Biden has signed more executive orders to combat climate change. The dictates map out the direction for Biden's climate change and environmental agenda. They include the creation of new climate change positions and an interagency task force within the new U.S. administration. The latest actions also pause new oil and gas leases on federal land and cutting fossil fuel subsidies. The president emphasized the need for the U.S. to lead the global response to climate change. 
And just like we need a unified national response to COVID-19, we desperately need a unified national response to the climate crisis, because there is a climate crisis. We must keep — we must lead global response, because neither challenge can be met, as Secretary Kerry has pointed out many times, by the United States alone. We know what to do. We've just got to do it. The U.S. Homeland Security has warned of further potential attacks from domestic extremists like the Capitol Hill storming. In a statement, the DHS said a broad range of ideologically motivated actors could incite or commit violence. It said a heightened threat environment will persist for weeks after President Biden's inauguration. Meanwhile, the U.S. has secured an indictment against three members of a far-right Oath Keepers militia. They are accused of conspiring the U.S. Capitol rights in a bid to stop the Congress from certifying Biden's election victory. The charge can carry a maximum prison sentence of 20 years. New Zealand will decarbonize its public buses by 2035 and introduce a law this year to import clean cars to cut emissions and fuel costs. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern said this in a news conference as the country pushes for a carbon neutral target by 2050. Ardern said the government will also mandate low emitting biofuels across its transport sector and buy only zero emissions public transport buses from 2025. The government aims to prevent up to 3 million tons of emissions by 2040. It will consider an incentive scheme to help people switch to clean cars. The death toll from Storm Eloise has risen to 21 after heavy rain and flooding caused destruction in parts of southern Africa. Mozambique, Zimbabwe, East Swatini and South Africa have largely been affected. An official from Mozambique said the country reported five new deaths while two people were killed in Eswatini. Tens of thousands of people have been displaced in Mozambique after vast swathes of land came underwater. The region is still recovering from two devastating cyclones, Edai and Kenneth of 2019. Climate change has had a tremendous impact on the people of Burkina Faso. Drought has become endemic, while violent floods have forced thousands of people to find refuge. Additionally, violence and the pandemic has made the country at the epicenter of the world's fastest growing displacement and protection crises. Details in this report. In Africa's turbulent Sahel region, Burkina Faso has been hit hard by climate change. One out of every 20 people is internally displaced. Across the Sahel, refugees, internally displaced people and their hosts are subjected to brutal violence, including rape and executions. I left home because of insecurity. Terrorists came into our village and started killing people. That's why we came here to Kongausi. The decreased rainfall and depletion of soil due to agriculture over-exploitation, deforestation are the main causes of the hard impact of climate change. As the agriculture sector collapses, more and more people are struggling to find refuge. For now, the situation shows no sign of improving. Climate change has become a threat multiplier. In this context, unsurprisingly, we are seeing conflict over farmland, conflict over grazing land and access to water, as well as its impact on conflict between communities and security issues. The COVID-19 pandemic has added a new layer of hardship for the refugees and further complicated efforts to support them. The United Nations Refugee Agency has obtained land from regional authorities to help the IDPs. UNHCR is also rehabilitating the refugee families who had to flee earlier this year. With minimum resources, it has become difficult to aid the larger number of internally displaced people. Imagine these people who have had to abandon everything, all their belongings, to flee insecurity and find themselves in a situation of total despair here. And then they have to bear the brunt of situation linked to global warming. It's a double dose of human suffering, difficult to bear. UNHCR has warned again that attacks by armed groups in the Sahel region will lead to further displacement in a region already hosting nearly two million IDPs and hundreds of thousands of refugees. 
In Vietnam, smartphones are helping rice farmers save their harvests. With sensors installed in fields, the farmers use their phones as an early warning system to detect salt before it can cause any damage. More in this report. Vietnam is a country that has been hit hard by climate change. Heavier rainfall and rising temperatures have increased the risk of floods, typhoons and droughts. Rising sea levels have seen salt water leaching into paddy fields and severely damaging crops. The International Fund for Agriculture Development has placed sensors in the farmers' fields. The results are monitors recorded and sent to farmers using a simple smartphone app. Every 15 minutes, a water sample is taken and on the database of sensors, the data is transferred to the operation centers and analyzed. Indicators such as salinity, alkalinity, pH level and tidal water level to notify people through the Ryan Mekong application system. The farmers receive instant alerts on their smartphones. These alerts have given farmers early warnings of increasing saline levels. Thus, they can act quickly to save the crops. In the past, if our parents or we wanted to know if the water was salty or not, we had to taste it like this to decide whether to get water into the field or not. But nowadays, we can stay at home and still be able to collect water information. IFADS new climate adaptation program aims to raise $500 million to help at least 10 million farmers adapt to climate change. It's time for a short break. We'll be back with more stories. Stay tuned. Apple has reported holiday quarter sales and profits that beat Wall Street expectations. New 5G iPhones helped push handset revenue to a new record and sparked a 57% rise in China sales. Apple's revenue for the quarter ended December 26 rose 21% to more than $111 billion. Earnings per share rose to $1.68 from $1.25. Sales of iPhones were 65.6 billion compared with estimates of 59.8 billion. They beat Apple's previous quarterly all-time high of 61.58 billion for the first quarter of fiscal 2018. The company also posted strong sales of its Mac laptops and iPads in the quarter. It was driven by consumers working, learning and playing from home during the pandemic. Samsung Electronics has posted a 26% rise in its operating profit in the fourth quarter of 2020 from a year earlier. The company says the increase was led by strong memory chip shipments and display panel sales. In a statement, Samsung said its operating profit in the quarter rose to over $8 billion. It said the company's revenue rose 3%. Meanwhile, the sole-based tech giant said it expects its overall profit to weaken in the first quarter of 2021. The forecast comes despite expected solid demand for its mobile products and data center business. Wall Street stocks have opened higher, shrugging off data, which showed a rise in weekly jobless claims. The stocks rose to their highs as the electronic company GameStop started to roll over amid a retail buying frenzy. American Airlines released its fourth quarter results showing loss of $9.6 billion in 2020. The S&P 500 index traded over 1% higher, while Nasdaq Composite and DJI indices also gained ground. Meanwhile, oil prices slid in Asia despite a huge drop in U.S. crude stock. And now the weather situation from around the globe.
And that's all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at Indus.News.